It's hoped this new symbol on menus will help protect the reputation of French food, but some of the country's chefs aren't impressed. On this week's programme, we'll find out why. On the programme this week, we're in France to find out why a change to menus is causing a stir in Parisian restaurants. There's dancing after dark at Mexico's Day of the Dead in this month's Global Guide. And we take a 60-second stopover in Amsterdam. Hello and welcome to The Travel Show, coming to you this week from Macau. Seeing the Chinese did invent fireworks, it should come as no surprise that the annual international fireworks competition here in Macau is one of the biggest in the world. And later on in the program, I'll be going behind the scenes to see how the event is pulled together and to reveal this year's winner. But first... We're in what used to be the undisputed global gastronomy capital, but now it's facing competition from many other places around the world. So, France is fighting back, as Sophie Van Bruggen reports. When you order food at a restaurant here, how much of it do you reckon has been freshly made to order? Well, barely any may be the answer. The trade union representing French restaurateurs reckons 85% is either vacuum packed or frozen. Some argue that's labour saving and cost efficient. But now, those 15% who do cook everything from scratch are getting their just desserts. So this is the logo that's been appearing on French menus and causing a lot of confusion. What it means is that if it appears next to the dish you've chosen, that everything has been freshly prepared within the kitchen. Which sounds very straightforward, doesn't it? But in fact, it's been causing a lot of problems here in France. You need to sear the meat before cooking. That is perfect. But what about Bruno here? He's got all the pedigree, he's taught some of the world's most famous chefs. But the method of cooking he's devised involves a system of searing, vacuum packing and reheating. He calls it sous vide. Any restaurants that he supplies will not qualify for the Fame Maison logo. And what's more, he thinks it's likely to punish innovation and stifle creativity. It's better to talk about the product, about the technology, about what you have in this recipe, how this recipe is prepared. Now, in France, you have a wall, a wall on your right, wall on your left. Now you have a wall on the top of a ceiling. You can't move. You are in your grave. Bonjour. Avec plaisir. So we're going to start a classic for her. If you want to get your bun ready and in the toaster, top down, bottom up. The cheese is from England. Kristen came from LA to Paris in 2011 and since then has been searching for the best way to make an American-style burger in her food truck using fresh French ingredients. She thinks she's just about cracked it. And to top it off, she's just been told she will qualify for Fame Maison status. So you're going to be proudly presenting the logo to all of your customers and tourists? No doubt at all. Uh, it was special for us also that the trucks were able to to, uh, to have access to this label. It wasn't certain from the beginning because we do have off-site kitchens where we do the production. Do you think there will be a few people who will try and cheat the system and say that stuff's fait maison when it's not? It's a change. And for people who have been saying their food is fait maison for so long who now will lose that, that privilege, uh, it could lead to, to some problems, but if the administration is prepared to control, then I think uh, we shouldn't see too many problems when it rolls out. But of course, the real test to see if something's homemade or not is all in the taste. One of these puddings has been lovingly made in a kitchen in Paris. The other was made in a factory. So let's see if people can taste the difference. Mm. 
I think um, this one is made by hand and this one is commercial. Right, I think this one has a chewier substance than that. Mm -hmm. That one seems fresher, I feel like. So that's why I would say that one's homemade. So we don't agree. I disagree with you. Well, it is quite nice, actually. I like them both. If I have to make a guess, I think that one's homemade. Pete, I think that one is it. Yeah. Okay, and what about the other one? What were your thoughts about the other one? It's quite flat in taste. That one is homemade, and that one's factory made. Lucky guess, I think. <laughs> the few people we tested were correct exactly 50% of the time. A far from convincing result. What it might indicate is that some people may appreciate a logo, letting them know what they're eating. Some, though, think it all feels a bit desperate. I'm very sad because I think I see, I hear the tourists coming to Paris. They are not in confidence. They don't think they will find simple and good food for small prices. It's, it's finished. It's over. But why is what looks initially like quite a minor change to some menus causing such ire? Well, France is still the world's most popular destination, with many of those arrivals motivated by what they can put into their stomachs. So, on economies on such a grand scale, even small tweaks can end up causing pretty large ripples. Sophie van Bruggen with a taste of France for us. And those new logos are appearing in menus now, but they won't be legally enforced until January next year. And if you're thinking of heading there, here's the travel show guide of things you might want to think about before you go. French waiters will not bring the bill until you ask for it. This is part of French hospitality. Bringing the bill before you ask for it would be like suddenly asking a guest to leave. Meals are long affairs in Paris, so no need to rush. If you get your timing right, you can visit some of the most popular museums and monuments in Paris for free. There are no entrance charges on the first Sunday of every month at a selection of museums. Among those included as tourist hotspots like the Louvre and Musée d'Orsay. Getting to major tourist attractions before they open will help avoid the large crowds and long queues which form later in the day. Some also open in the evening when crowds are often smaller. But make sure the place you want to visit is actually open on the day you plan to go. Many Parisian attractions are closed one day a week. And taxis in Paris can be expensive, so consider taking the metro or walking to your destination. A cab ride that is only a few kilometres long can end up costing a small fortune. This is especially true late at night, when taxi fares go up. Time now for this week's travel update. We begin this week in the UK, where one of its leading visitor attractions, Kew Gardens, is offering the chance to try intoxicants from around the world. The workshops are part of a season featuring lectures and exhibitions on mind-altering plants. Visitors will have to sign a medical disclaimer before being allowed to sample the testers on offer. To the US and flight delays and cancellations at Chicago's two major airports may continue way into next week. It follows a fire at a nearby air traffic control center, which destroyed a number of high-tech computers and a radar facility. And finally, this isn't something you see on holiday every day, dozens of dogs taking to the waves in California for the annual Surf City Surf Dog Contest. Joey, Hi. reverse takeoff. Now in its sixth year, more than two and a half thousand locals and tourists took to the beach to watch more than 60 dogs take part in the challenge. Still to come on the travel show. I'm in China going backstage with the teams at Macau's International Fireworks Contest. So don't go away.
Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Hello, this is my global guide, destination highlights, insider buzz and top tips on where to go and when to go. I'm Michelle Yana Chan. First, here in the UK, the Kickstarter Film Festival happens in October in London. A celebration of features, shorts, documentaries, animations and video art. There were hundreds of entries in response to an open call for submissions. The London Kickstarter Film Festival comes on the back of similar events in New York and Los Angeles. If you're more of a foodie than a film buff, Italy is hosting the International White Truffle Fair in Alba from October 11th. At this time of year, Alba draws aficionados to the Piedmont region of the north of the country during the late autumn harvest. There are market stalls hosted by truffle hunters who sell truffle oil, cheeses encrusted with slivers of white truffle, truffle pasta and truffle butter. It's aromatic and addictive. Look to the skies in the state of New Mexico in the US as it hosts the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta. From October 4th, there'll be mass ascensions, flying competitions and daily dawn patrol shows set to music. These are choreographed inflations and launches at the hour of sunrise. This annual gathering is usually favored with excellent ballooning conditions down to clear October skies and a phenomenon called the Albuquerque Box a unique combination of topography and weather patterns. Back on the ground, the streets of South Korea will be buzzing from October 1st when the High Seoul Festival takes place. There are five days of street art and interpretive performance, much of it non-verbal, to encourage communication between people who don't share a common language. Head to the city's main squares of Guanghuamen and Cheonggye Plaza. For a visual feast after dark, the Circle of Light Festival happens in Moscow October 10th to 14th at several locations across the Russian capital. This year, Tsaritsino Park, the Bolshoi Theatre and Austin Kino Tower Spectators will be able to see light installations, laser and audio visual shows, and multimedia and musical extravaganzas. There'll also be masterclasses and workshops at the Digital October Centre. For more After Dark antics, towards the end of October and early November, Mexico will be commemorating the Day of the Dead a religious and cultural celebration to remember relatives and friends who've passed away. It can be sombre, but it can also be rather ghoulish, like at Laca Laca Festival in San Miguel de Allende. Across the country's cemeteries, families arrive with brooms to sweep clean the grave sites, as well as to decorate tombs with minstrels and mariachi bands providing music. The best time to visit is after dark, when cemeteries are at their liveliest. <laughs> That's my global guide this month. Let me know what's happening in the place where you live or where you love. We're on Facebook, Twitter and email. Until next time, happy travelling. Next up, we meet some of the people who make our cities tick. This time, we're riding high in Western Norway on board the Flom Railway. I've been working here for 38 years. It's a pleasure. I, I think I have a dream work. Going up, seeing all this beautiful landscape, seeing the fjords, seeing the waterfalls, all the happy people, all are smiling, all are on holiday. My name is Knut Kwame. I'm working as a guard in the Flom Line. Oh, it's a great journey. It's coming uh, tourists from all over the world. In the summertime, it's coming approximately 700,000 visiting us here. You come here from the fjord at the sea route. You come up and you go up to the mountains. Morning. Thank you. I would like to welcome you on board the Flom Railway. 
we will be traveling from Flom of the shore of the Aulensfjord up to Myrdal Station and the Bergen Railway, 866 meters above sea level. We have to stop at a waterfall named Chusfossen. There are some ladies coming out singing and dancing for us. Norwegian fairy tale. It's such a woman who's living in the mountain. She's never had a man for several years. And with good weather, she comes out and sing. And the ma man can't. Oh, they think, what a wonderful woman. And they go up to her and they disappear into the mountain. You never see them again. This waterfall here. We reduce the power, the pipeline behind us goes back to the power station. The power station produces the power for running all the plumb line. Good for the nature. We're not using anything. We're now at uh, our end station, Myrdal, at the top of the plumb line, 867 meters above sea level. And we're now uh, just waiting for a train from Oslo coming with 200 new passengers for us, and we are going back again to Flum. Next and final stop is Flom, platform to the left hand side. I've been many places but come back again to Flom. I think oh, this is the most beautiful place. Next, we're in Macau on the southern coast of China. It's the only place in the country where gambling is legal. But it's not just the neon lights of the city-state's casinos that have been lighting up the night sky. For several weeks each year, the multicolored explosions of Macau's International Firework Contest take over the skyline. I went to check it out. So we're on our way to a barge in Macau's inner harbor to meet some of the teams taking part in this year's fireworks competition. Each year, 10 teams from around the world take part in a contest that runs over five weeks. Hi, Hi. you must be Nicola. Yes, I'm Nicola. Hi. Nicola is representing Croatia. This year will be the first time a Croatian team has competed in the event. Uh, he's 72. He shows me how a traditional aerial firework is normally formed, with a shell that has four parts, a round cylindrical container of paper and string, packed with sparkler-like stars and a bursting charge, as well as a fuse. There are over 1,300 shells on this 25-meter barge, as well as 700 smaller single-shot explosions. So, we have the, here the five positions with the shells. They each position have the different angle because we want to make a picture of it on the sky. This is the sixth, this is the biggest shell in a show. So for an 18 minute show, yeah. you've got over 2,000 tiny explosions going yeah. off. Yes. That's amazing. And how long does it take you to set up? For that show, we need uh, two weeks. So this is the lasers. Yeah. Painstaking calculations needed to control the display are done on a computer. First of all, you, you must choose the music. After that, you must uh, put the music in a software. You must make the show the all on a computer. After that, I print the layout. The hard slog begins when you start placing the fireworks on the barge, with each team braving temperatures as high as 37 degrees Celsius. Enjoy our, our On the adjoining barge is the Polish team. It's also their first time in the competition. The weather is uh, hard to, yeah. um, to work here because of the, um, a lot of sun and sometimes a lot of rain, yes, because it's the, the, the climate. So it's really hard to work uh, 10 hours without, for example, tent. It's crazy. Yeah. Yes. So us standing here, is it dangerous? No, no. The standing here is not that dangerous. For sure it's the fireworks if you if you, um, if you decide to, to, 
to follow s uh, small safety, it's, it's okay, yes? You, you cannot uh, uh, smoking here in this area, for sure, because it's dangerous. You cannot do work uh, without the permission. So uh, for our staff, there are all the professional fire workers, which has got the uh, special papers for this, yes? The Polish barge has over 1,000 shells on board, and each one needs to be connected to a time-delayed fuse. We are almost ready, we need to only connect these two positions and uh, all the show is ready. Mm -hmm. So we will be ready, I think, in uh, two hours. The theme of tonight is Lords of Fire. Please enjoy the show. More than 200 metres away, which is the required safe distance, 11 judges cast their votes beneath the Macau Tower. Marks are awarded for choreography, safety, height and colour of the fireworks and how the show looks overall. But for the crowds gathered on the waterfront, each and every display is spectacular and dazzling. And the winners were China. Spain and Australia were the runners-up. Pretty spectacular sight in the skies over Macau. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for in this edition of the programme. Coming up next week... Addy's at the UK's first 3D printing cafe, creating his very own souvenir to take home. Are you trying to tell us something? <laughs> Now the technology being used here is quite literally mind-boggling. Now you start off with whatever material you want to use to make the image and it comes out, for instance, this is plastic in this sort of coil-like material and then it's injected at heat through this tube into the machine which reads off information that you've given to an SD card and then prints out your image. Simple as that. It's bonkers. I hope you can join us for that if you can. And don't forget, you can follow us real time on our journeys wherever we are in the world by signing up to our social media feeds. The details are on the screen now. But until then, from me, Carmen Roberts, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Macau, it's goodbye.